Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome everyone to the Global Summit of the Climate Governance Initiative. This initiative is organized by the chapters in collaboration with the World Economic Forum. The Climate Governance Initiative is targeted to non-executive directors to increase their engagement in the climate transition. So in particular, in our session, we will be addressing, we will be addressing the role of markets in driving the transition towards the zero carbon economy. Our session is organized by Chapter Zero France, which is a young chapter. It was launched this past December and has three key supporting chairs from the financial services. So today we have around 500 attendees. Many of you are non-executive directors and we invite you to join your chapters in your corresponding countries to deepen your knowledge about climate transition and share experiences with peers. Our session today, today will be recorded and will be available in the chapters, uh, Chapter France website later on. And uh, before we get started, I would like to remind you this is going to be a conversation. I'm hoping that this is a conversation interactive. So I invite you to use the Q&A throughout uh, this one hour and 15 minutes that we have. Those questions I will be receiving in my iPad privately. So please do not hesitate to ask poignant questions to our panelists on different topics. And let me advance you the topics that we are gonna to be discussing today 
with our four panelists. We're gonna be talking about the details about on transition, what it means and what are the challenges first and foremost. We're gonna be talking about board dynamics and what are the skills that you as non-executive directors may need in order to foster this transition for real. We're gonna be talking a little bit about assessing climate risk and how it may change decision-making at your corporations. And finally, we will close about governance, a discussion about governance roadblocks at a larger scale. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our panelists. We have today with us Jean Lemire, chairman of BNP Paribas. BNP Paribas is the leader bank in providing credit with sustainable criteria. Sustainable criteria. We have Lorenzo Binismaghi, who's the chairman of Societe Generale. Societe Generale has been a bank, uh, an energy bank, and is currently shifting towards being an energy transition bank. We have with us Kate Hampton, who's the CEO of the Children Investment Fund Foundation. The foundation has committed one third of its funds to climate issues and as well on the, um, on the activist side is pushing for a, a say on climate proposal and we will discussing more about that. And finally, we have with us Jürgen Rinterig who's first vice president of the EBRD and the EBRD has recently adopted a new capital framework committed to green finance in 50% of its businesses. Okay, so I would like to start our conversation with the first open question, which is about transition. Uh, first question to Lorenzo Binismaghi. How, you know, how does your institution think about transition and in particular transitioning to lower financed uh, emissions? Well, first, uh, thank you uh, very much for this invitation. Uh, clearly in Europe, the banking system has a key role to play in, uh, in fostering uh, the transition because in Europe, most of the financing, about 70% of financing goes through banks. So banks uh, have uh, an important role to play. Uh, over time, maybe the capital market will develop, but right now, uh, banks have an important role. And, and clearly we, um, as, as other banks, have, uh, are playing this role, this role. As you just said, we are moving, if we can take a catchword from a, an energy bank to an energy transition bank. And uh, we do this in, in three main ways, if I can uh, mention that. First, uh, shifting the capital allocation towards low carbon. So uh, uh, we set for ourselves uh, ambitious goals uh, uh, to, uh, uh, for ourselves to uh, bring down uh, financing in the, uh, in the uh, brown economies and uh, in uh, uh, instead of increasing financing to the renewable and we are a leader in that in the sector the second uh, way in which we do that is by helping our clients to achieve their own goals uh, through advisory through financing to providing innovative solutions uh, in particular and the third uh, way is to try to work with our uh, uh, with other banks with other institutions to define standards which mm -hmm. is a ESG standard, which is a very important uh, in this uh, 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 period, in this phase in which we have to, uh, to address this transition. So to assess uh, uh, whether we are achieving our targets or not and to define our targets, it's important to have good standards and we will come back to that. So we work together with our clients, with our uh, counterparts, with other banks, for instance, there is a uh, an important uh, a club, which is called the Katowice uh, Coalition, where we have defined this standard. Let me, uh, uh, for the okay. sake of the discussion, uh, 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 conclude uh, this first uh, intervention by reminding all, all of us that uh, banks, however, are like any other companies. They are in the markets. They, uh, uh, they have their own governance, shareholders, so they can operate if they have the right incentives. Uh, uh, and I think it's important uh, also for the policymakers, and we will come back at the end maybe of our discussions, that uh, uh, we need to think about the right policies, the right incentives to make sure that everybody is aligned and can make its own contribution to help others achieve these targets. But this can be done through incentives rather than thinking about uh, uh, penalizing or punishing or, 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 or increasing uh, 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 obstacles 
for, for market participants. I think this is an important uh, uh, issue to keep in, in, in mind because sometimes people think that banks are just uh, you know, an instrument of policy that you can lever uh, right or, or left and things happen mechanically. This is, not, this is not the case. Bank can help, but they need to have the right incentives to do that. Thank you. Let me pass uh, the baton to Jean Lemire to discuss, you know, what is your point of view on this, uh, on going through this transition in cutting uh, financed emissions? Well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for asking the question. And uh, I, I welcome what Lorenzo has said. You know, we, we, we are competitors, but we may share the same goals. And uh, we do share the same goal that... Uh, uh, the planet in the future are key. And, uh, you know, in, in a bank first, we need to, to make a clear view about risk. And of course, risk is uh, about sustainability. We, we need to be careful about sustainability. Otherwise, there's no future, there's no long-term investment, there's no quality investment, and that would be very dangerous for the whole industry and the world. Uh, we, we have made in BNP Paribas a conclusion out of this is that the notion of sustainability must be fully part of the decision-making process of the bank. It's not on top of, it's not, it is embedded in the process. And that's the real point on which we, we work hard to make sure that all the decisions do take into account this dimension. Uh, of course, what, what, what is sustainable and not sustainable is important as such. And uh, uh, we praise the EU for the taxonomy policy, which, which has been discussed, because it helps a lot. But as you said, uh, it's not enough. Uh, the world today is, is not made only about green or not green assets. Uh, there are assets which could become greener, to say it simply. And that's the transition notion uh, Lorenzo has mentioned, and uh, we, we work a lot on this. What have, what have we done at the beginning? We have said, look, there are some sectors in which we don't operate any longer. You have uh, shale gas, shale oil, you have the Arctic, uh, you know policies on coal. But very quickly, we have seen that it's not enough. If we want to meet the targets we have, we need to do more for ourselves and for the clients. And working with the clients for a bank is helping the client to improve the situation for itself. And it's, we are at the beginning of the process. We have already engaged with some sectors and companies, notably, uh, those who produce the more CO2 emissions to try to see how over time they can reduce what they do, mm -hmm. provided they take commitments and we can measure. So I will not be too long on the notion of transition, but the notion of transition is at the core of what banks can do. I'm very happy the vice president of the EBRD is part of the panel because in my memory, <laughs> The EBRD is the specialist of transition, not transition to, to green, but transition to market economy and to multi-party democracy. But the notion of transition is difficult. Why? Because it is based on a fair initial assessment, on a trend, and an assessment at the end. And of course, it must be based on measurement and making a lot of decisions if the various steps are not respected by the client. It is a challenging, disciplined process, and we are at the beginning of this. The only institution which is much advanced on this is the EBRD. So I would welcome uh, uh, the first vice president of the EBRD, I salute, uh, uh, to remind us what is transition. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. Thank, thank you very much, Mireya. And, uh, and also, of course, uh, Jean, for your kind introductions and good afternoon all. Before I comment, let me say that uh, Jean likely knows EBRD much better than I do. As uh, Jean, you have led the bank for eight years and I joined less than three years ago. Um, 
although you might not be, Jean, uh, we actually met a few times uh, during the Foreign Investors Council meetings in Kazakhstan when I was working for ABN Emirates at the time. Um, and by the way, when my colleagues learned I was on a panel uh, uh, with you, some of them mentioned it was actually Jean Lemire who single-handedly pushed us to go green already at that point in time. Although uh, they also added that we did lose some money on some of the initiatives he proposed. Um, the, the, the second thing I would like to say is that no major transition is without its, uh, its difficulties. And that is also true for the transition towards zero carbon. Um, there is no nice gradual path and there are lots of setbacks and, 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 and roadblocks along the way. And uh, Jean was very, very kind to EBRD, but it is also true for, uh, for EBRD. Um, and if we would have had this discussion about a year ago, well, we probably wouldn't have done it virtually, uh, but anyhow, uh, I would have been incredibly proud by saying that EBRD has achieved an all-time uh, record in terms of green investments. Uh, in fact, 46% of all investments of the EBRD in 2019 had a green financing component. And then came COVID. And COVID for the EBRD actually meant that uh, we did not always have the opportunity to add conditionality to our financing. Yes, indeed, our choice was sometimes just to keep a company uh, afloat. And this actually has meant that the green financing percentage last year in 2020 has actually dropped to below 30% again. So it is like this. But, um, but what are green investments for the uh, EBRD actually? These are projects resulting in, uh, let's say measurable net environmental benefits relative to uh, what we would say uh, are baseline scenarios with the baseline scenario being what would have happened in the absence of a, uh, a project. And uh, we will always look at the deployment of best available technology, uh, practices and standards of uh, environmental performance. And uh, for us, green investments can mean both climate mitigation, for example, uh, energy efficiency, renewables, low carbon technology, et cetera, where we can see reduced carbon emissions, but also it can mean, for example, climate adaptation with uh, impact metrics such as reduced weather related damage uh, or so. And of course, there are environmental areas as well, circular economy, protection of biodiversity, but uh, I will not uh, go into that. And uh, I, I saw already on the questions, a few questions on how you incentivize uh, uh, companies, but I will uh, uh, wait for later uh, till I'm we will, to we answer will get some into of the incentives. Yes, we are receiving a lot of questions about balancing investments with uh, climate commitments and uh, other incentives. But let me pass for uh, the baton to Kate Hampton. Uh, you're representing a philanthropic as well as an investor side. And I would like to ask, to ask you, how would you characterize the nature of the discussions that you're having with uh, the corresponding um, corporations with regard to climate transition? Yeah, so hi. So Children's Investment Fund Foundation is a philanthropic foundation. So we, because we have an endowment, we're a $6 billion asset owner at the same time as making grants to uh, nonprofit organizations. Um, and we spend about $400 million a year on, on NGO funding. Um, a substantial portion of that goes to climate. And so as a consequence, we, you know, we've been funding platforms like uh, CDP for a long time, where 10,000 companies now disclose. And about seven years ago, we encouraged them to rank companies in sectors based on their exposure to different carbon prices. So one of the early sort of stress testing experiments. Um, but even though companies have been quite far advanced in disclosures, um, in banks, we're not seeing uh, much collection of data on clients um, or making that a mandatory condition of, of new loans. Um, and so I think, you know, the, the banking sector is, is behind relative to the corporate sector. Um, I mean, sorry, the lights keep going off because there's no one in the building, so I might have to wave my arms wildly every now and again. Um, 
But um, over the last couple of years, investor attention um, has shifted towards actually setting targets, not just disclosing, but setting targets. And now we're moving towards more transition plans, as we've heard. Um, and so there's about there's about 1,600 companies that have sent science-based targets under the Science-Based Targets Initiative. Um, 400 have been validated. Um, but one of our grantees estimates that less than 10 of those have actually got a plan to achieve that goal. And I think some of you will have seen a couple of days ago, the Climate Action 100 plus um, net zero company benchmark yesterday showed that zero, zero out of the 168 key global emitters have a CapEx plan in line with their net zero target. So even though there's disclosure and some target setting in terms of actually having a plan backed up by um, real spending, um, we're falling far short. Um, mm. So investor attention, um, the conversations that we're having um, are around how do we shift attention away from uh, net zero targets, useful though they are, to transition plans, um, business strategy, capital investment, and that means short term targets. Um, and this will also require uh, linkage to executive compensation um, to incentivize um, better performance against these, these metrics. Um, and I think you'll see a corollary with what's happening in the climate negotiations for COP26, where a lot of countries are aligning around net zero, but the near term actions don't match up to the long term ambition. So countries are going through this process as well, trying to make their near term targets and their plans match up to their long term ambitions. So what we're trying to do is work with all of those in the ecosystem. Um, and obviously, there are a lot of private sector providers that providing ESG and other services to companies. But what we do is we support the sort of public interest, um, open source uh, benchmarking and other efforts to support companies in the transition and make sure um, that that happens um, in a transparent way that enables full engagement with stakeholders and government. Um, and we'll be helping companies that want to make the transition, of course, through these different grantees. But we're also not afraid of ensuring that shareholder resolutions, board votes and litigation are deployed um, against those companies that aren't willing to make uh, the transition. And I think we'll see investor attention focus there going forward. Mm -hmm. You've said something interesting that we can pass it back to uh, our um, chairmen of, of the distinct different banks whether banks should have a responsibility or an incentive to collect the data beyond you know, what corporations could themselves be disclosing. I mean, if um, there, there are many, many challenges here, but one is the lack of data, uh, right? So you know, if I ask uh, Société Générale or BNP Paribas, what is the percentage of corporations that actually disclose in your portfolio that would actually disclose data on uh, on emissions or on uh, on climate impact, right? That that's going to be fairly fairly low. So I would like to ask you what what are what would be the incentives that banks need to actually accelerate the decarbonization across your clients, Lorenzo? If you want to uh, discuss, well, I, I think incentives. It, well, first. Um, uh, um, Climate risk is, is, is affecting all risks. It's, it's not really a new risk. It, it affects credit risk, market risk, uh, uh, reputational risk, operational risk. So it changes the nature of all the risks. So if we want to assess, uh, the, for instance, the credit risk, lending to a large corporate, mm -hmm. it is clear that we have to uh, include the climate uh, 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 risk into this assessment. And therefore, we will use the data, of course, that we have about our counterparties. And the same applies for, for others. So I mean, we are in the business of collecting, of course, data and assessing uh, the risk. Now, I, I think what was mentioned earlier is uh, to make all this public. And of course, this is cannot be the role of a bank to, to collect data for, for, for others. But it is it would be easier, of course, if uh, some of the data that we have to, to collect bilaterally or to mm -hmm. discuss bilaterally was more publicly available. And I think this is also the, the scope of uh, several initiatives that are taking place in terms of also of setting standards, how to measure. And this is, this is another chapter. I don't know if we will talk about this, but this, uh, this uh, issue of setting standards, I think it's, it's a very important uh, 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 
uh, item, I would say, in, at the European level and at the global level, of course. I would, yes, Jürgen, please. Yeah, just uh, two things. Uh, first of all, commenting on, on Kate. Actually, uh, Kate's answer shows that sentiments and attitude uh, changes. Um, uh, let's remember how, that less than 15 years ago, um, and it might be before your time, uh, Kate, but it was the Children's Investment Fund that was only interested in shareholder value and actually called off the breakup of the bank where I was working at that point in time, it was Avon Emerald Bank. Uh, having said that, it is because of you, Kate, that I made the decision from the, let's call it the dark side of banking to development banking. So ultimately, uh, you were uh, the basis of, for me, a very positive uh, transition. So thank you very much for that. But um, coming back on the, the, on the disclosure for, for banking, I, I strongly believe in walking uh, the talk. And as uh, some of you know, EBRD was the first MDB, multilateral development bank for that matter, to become a supporter of uh, what um, is called the TCFD, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures. Uh, and we, um, we became a supporter already in 2018. And this practice of leading by example provides EBRD with first-hand experience to support its, its partners and clients. And we recognize the uh, systemic importance of climate-related financial risk. We are now putting in place a systemic uh, climate risk function that will enable us to identify and manage climate-related financial risk in our investment pipelines and portfolio. Um, and then uh, maybe just one more thing. Um, just this new framework will involve uh, two components. It will involve project risk uh, analysis, uh, uh, systematic uh, screening and scoring of all new projects for common transition risk and physical climate risk, and also portfolio analysis. So the bank is developing a capability to access the impact of climate risk on an investment on a more uh, systemically uh, important portfolio level. Um, yeah, that's, I, I probably would uh, like to leave it with this. Thank you, Jürgen. I would like to ask a follow-up question to Jean Lemire. You've mentioned that transition involves being very precise with the methodology for uh, measuring, then having a benchmark to evaluate, and then having as well a process to account for responsibilities. Could you tell us a little bit more about this third part, you know, the accounting for responsibilities and slash, you know, potential sanctions. I know that sanction sounds as a strong word, but you know, at the end, there has to be some sort of accountability in the process for the transition to take place. Well, uh, I'll, I'll be specific because uh, uh, we need to speak about what we do and the way we can bring progress. What is the question for a bank? Is to have a client make a full assessment of the situation of the company on this ground, and then to make a decision, which is, do we continue to work with you? Do we stop working with you? This is a decision we take on companies using coal, for instance. And there are many utilities, in, even in Europe, which continue to use coal. Then the, the discussion is, then we can say we, we don't finance you any longer because you partially use coal. We can say something different. And that's the key debate, which is, if you embark on a journey for improving your situation and exiting coal, mm -hmm. we can finance the investments you need to make to exit coal. And then you decide a journey, which is a business plan, a capex plan, and then you fix dates and you control year after year what's happening. Where is the sanction? The sanction is you stop funding if 
the commitment taken is not respected. Okay, that's my job. You know, I'm not an official institution. My job is to finance the economy. And I do believe that clients must have a journey, some of them, many of them, a journey to improve their situation. So you have two schools of thought behind what I say. One say, no, there's the small portion of coal, stop. Or the second school says, no, let's improve. The path we try to follow in BNP Paribas is the second one, which is improvement. So this is what we do today. We have started doing so. Maybe uh, it's not visible enough. Maybe there are frustrations because it should go faster. But this is what we do in sectors which use coal and uh, uh, hydrocarbon energy. And step by step, we should address all the economic sectors which are producing CO2 emissions to make sure that there is a clear project. So that's key. Now, of course, behind this, you have a question, which is measurement, data, Disclo not disclosure, but measurement. We need to be able to have uh, uh, good measurement systems, which are accepted across the world among, among banks. There's a lot of work being done today. We, we are putting in place a methodology. That's exactly what we should do. You know, we, we don't have, uh, Madame, the same question as yours. Your question is, should I put my money or not? Well, if it is not green, you don't put money. If it is green, you put money. Our question is probably different, is how to bring a company to a better situation. Why? To en enable you to invest into that company. So we, we, we are additional. We, we do the same job, but not to, with the same processes. Lorenzo, would you like to follow up on this idea on how transitions is? No, no, that's, I, think, I think that's full in line with what we are doing. That's what I mentioned at the beginning, uh, you know, moving from an energy uh, uh, bank to an uh, energy transition. Um, of course, the, 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 I, I see some of the questions, how do you decide, uh, for instance, if your client is a big client, uh, uh, which owes you money, how can you really stop? And that's why I think working with the clients and uh, uh, if the clients are committed to uh, the common standards, uh, setting uh, clear deadlines that can be measured and accounted for, I think it's a win-win it's a situation because in the end, for the bank, you invest uh, in something that is uh, profitable, and for the company, you align yourself with your commitment. So, uh, I, I think the issue uh, that, that I saw in many, in many, in many uh, questions is uh, how quick is a transition, uh, and what is a transition? You, of course, you can stop uh, coal, but then if you don't provide some other alternatives uh, in terms of energy. Can you move immediately from coal to renewable? Now, if for a country like China, this is not possible. Uh, uh, so how can you help China, for instance, moving from coal to something that is cleaner, for instance, gas? Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and, you know, so, so you have to ask yourself all of these questions. And if this, uh, over a time span that is consistent with the international commitments, uh, then, then it is worthwhile uh, doing it and, and account for it and be, tra and be transparent to the extent that you you disclose uh, annually, and maybe uh, we should disclose more and more, but uh, to disclose how your financing is contributing to this, to this transition. Thank you. Um, Mireia, if I, if I may, I mean, um, transitioning from coal to gas is a dead end. Gas at 3% leakage has emissions as bad as coal, um, and 3% leakage is, is, is the regulated US rate, and the rest of the world it's more like 10%. So gas is actually worse than coal in terms of carbon emissions because of the methane. And those assets will be stranded. There are already um, power plants which have renewables and storage, which are cheaper than new gas. So gas is going to be stranded, and encouraging Asia to move to gas is, is not helpful uh, for your shareholders and it's not helpful for the planet and it's not even helpful for the taxpayers of those countries. So I think um, we do have to be very clear-sighted about what consistent with net zero means. 
Um, and it doesn't mean that there will be no gas in the near term, but one has to assess what we're using gas for. Um, um, and, and certainly in electricity, um, China can move to clean energy um, with adequate power sector reform. But I just wanted to come back on this issue of engagement that Mr. Lumiere raised, which I think is really important. So, I mean, we divested fully of fossil fuels from our endowment. Um, but we, we very much advocate for an engagement process and there's a clear engagement cycle with companies because all companies have a role to play in the transition, I would say with the exception of fossil fuels. Um, there are many um, opportunities to engage um, and um, if a but if a board is not willing to engage with, with shareholders and other stakeholders, um, shareholders may eventually have to propose a new board. So that is in fact the sanction is that, that the performance of non-executive directors is going to be dependent on the, upon their ability to engage with the climate issue. It's, it's not possible to be passive anymore. Um, and it doesn't make sense for, for any of us to pretend that there isn't a systemic risk along the lines that Mr. Lumiere described earlier. Um, um, and already we're seeing that companies achieve a lower cost of capital uh, with um, the green transition. Moody's and SNP have signed up to say on climate, which suggests that this is going to be uh, really important. Um, we're already seeing, um, you know, 50 basis points difference for, for green bonds. So um, we are starting to see these issues being priced into the market. So it, it's, it's a very dynamic situation. And, you know, as, as we were discussing earlier, things move quickly. Who would have thought that the um, eradication of the internal combustion engine would come so fast? The, the, the dates keep moving forward and not just the regulatory dates, but the expectations of the market as to when electric vehicles will surpass combustion engines in terms of cost parity. So, um, you know, things will move quickly and any decisions taken now are at risk. Um, both from a transition perspective, not just from a, from a physical risk perspective. Um, but I just wanted to draw specific attention to the issue of gas because um, there is a very, very, very significant risk. That could be the difference between us achieving net zero and not achieving net zero if we have a false energy transition to gas in the near term. Thank you, Kate. So I would like, I mean, this is a great segue to start discussing what is the role of the board in uh, in this transition and i would like to ask uh your well jürgen may, may, may i just uh, comment on what was said because this shows that we are facing real life dilemmas and um uh, as you know ebrd invests in 38 economies from kosovo to uzbekistan from poland to tunisia and it is clear that uh, one f a size fits not all so what we do is uh, participate in the formulation of pathways to uh, so actually, I'm coming back to what Jean and Lorenzo are, uh, uh, did mention, uh, consistent with long-term decarbonization goals that uh, define our investment requirements. And of course, I can now mention all the great stuff about EBRD's support for uh, coal transition in the Western Balkans and Ukraine. I can tell you now about uh, 500 megawatt of, of wind and solar capacity financed in the Western Balkans in the last three years and, uh, and, 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 and many other things. But I have to be honest, um, the real dilemmas are somewhere else. Only a few weeks ago, and this, this ties into what Kate was, uh, uh, was saying, only a few weeks ago, we had to decide whether to invest in a new high efficiency combined cycle gas power plant in Uzbekistan. And just looking at this project, it is of course fair to say that this new investment will increase CO2 uh, emissions for many years to come. But what if I tell you that as a result of this investment, the country agreed to follow a decarbonization roadmap and will get rid of old dirty coal-fired power plants earlier. So basically the project will help accelerate rather than delay decarbonization. Um, and yes, uh, we all know at this point in time that uh, the base load power is still needed to complement and facilitate the uh, growing renewable um, generating capacity in any country. And lastly, um, there was something about in, in incentives. Um, and more and more, we also actively support financing instruments that incentivizes companies um, to do the, the right thing. And again, an, uh, a very brief example, 
only two weeks ago, we invested 50 million in the first sustainability link bond issued by uh, uh, the largest power utility in Greece, uh, PPC. And the bond will actually include a sustainability performance target with the company committing to reduce CO2 emissions by 40% by the end of 2022. And from 23, the interest rate payable on the note will step up actually by 50 basis points. So that means 0.5% unless the target has been met. So that's, uh, uh, that corresponds very well with the 50 basis point Kate uh, uh, mentioned. Over to you again, Mary. Thank you very much, Jürgen. So I would like to pass to the second topic uh, today, which is how, what is the role of boards in pushing for this transition? And let me ask this first to Lorenzo Vinismagi. How do you think that the, what is the role of the board and uh, what should the skills be of the non-executive directors to actually push forward these transition plans? Yeah, I mean, I mentioned earlier that, you know, a, a climate change affects uh, all dimensions of, um, of the strategy of, of a bank. So it is a strategic issue. So it has to be dealt by the board primarily by the board. Uh, and um, I would say um, the whole board has to be equipped uh, uh, to deal with that. So uh, we would not be in favor of having one specialist uh, uh, for climate issues. And then, you know, everything is, is, is uh, uh, on his or her shoulders. So um, this is why we have, um, and as I mentioned, it affects all uh, elements of, uh, of a decision uh, uh, making uh, in, in the board from remuneration. And, uh, and so in our remuneration committee, we, we deal with these issues, for instance, in, in our system, uh, variable remuneration of top management mm -hmm. includes uh, some variables related to, to, to transition. Uh, of course, it affects risk. So the risk committee and uh, uh, has to deal with these issues and so, so on and so forth. So it, it is a multidimensional uh, 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 element and finally and ultimately ends up in uh, uh, in the board discussion so it's a question of being having everybody fully understand the implication rather than compartmentalizing uh, some uh, uh, the, the dealing with each these issues with, with with a few people or a few committees mm -hmm. jean lemire would you like to add something about managing these dilemmas that jürgen was mentioning right how do you manage these dilemmas this contradictory no, I, at the board. I, I think the first question for the board is uh, all the members uh, must be made aware of the, the challenges. I say this because uh, there are big consequences. It's a strategy. Uh, there, there are questions about sanctions. But first, I see many boards. Members of the boards have to be made aware. And, and first, there's a question of education, you know, uh, raising questions, uh, bringing skills for everybody to understand well. I think each of the members must have a good understanding of, of what's happening and why they need to do it. Uh, second, there must be open and, and fair discussions with the management about this, meaning what are the options? What does it mean? Because a board is about strategy, but it's about deliveries. What, what can we do? What should we do? What is the best impact we can have? What are the consequences of the, on the operations, on the clients, on the business lines? So you need to go in step by step in depth, not only about the awareness, but also about the business itself. What does it mean? And what are the options? That's absolutely key. And then, of course, you have all the points mentioned by, by Lorenzo, from risk assessment to remuneration to strategy, business development. But the key point for the board, once uh, uh, boards have agreed, is to make sure that within the management, it is fully taken into account. I say this because the worst for a board would be to see a sustainable policy, which is a PR policy, which is about communication. And of course, 
we, we miss the target if we do so. So board have to make sure that within the management, it is well taken into account, well implemented. And then you go back to the same point, you know, it cannot be one person. It must be fully embedded into the decision-making process and boards have to make sure through the dialogue with the management that this is the case. And you can see it quite easily, you know, when boards interviews managers have discussions about risk, business, in committees, in the full board, you understand well, it's, it comes quickly how far it is embedded. And the more it is embedded, the better it is. I think the first responsibility of the board is to make sure that this concern is fully embedded. The way we do, we have done over time for risk or for compliance, you know, it's the same. Thank you. So maybe this is a good segue to ask Kate about your say on climate in order to push for this full embeddedness of climate uh, at the corporation uh, level. Yes, and I was I was very impressed with the comments from Lorenzo and Jean about the need to to do this comprehensively, and it is a process. Everybody's learning, but there's lots of help out there. So that's the that's the good news. Um, in terms of um, say on climate, so so this came out of um, our concern that a lot of people were focusing on targets and not on uh, real um, transformative action in the near term. So we established the Say on Climate initiative, which is calling for the annual disclosure of of emissions for companies, a transition plan to manage those emissions, and an annual shareholder vote. And a number of climate leaders um, have adopted this voluntarily, and others are being encouraged to do so via shareholder resolutions. So the likes of Unilever and, and National Grid and Fovial and some others have adopted this, this, this approach. Uh, Unilever came out with theirs um, just a couple of days ago. And um, this is about a clear engagement cycle. Um, and um, it, 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 you know, the ultimate sanction is obviously removing the board as we've heard, but there, there are lots of opportunities for shareholders to engage um, on these different aspects of, of, of risk before taking that step. Um, but our concern is that, you know, we've done some analysis on this and one of our grantees found that 80% of the directors of the largest five UK banks uh, were also on the boards of high emitting industries. Now, it's not to say you should ban somebody from being on a board because they're on some other board. That's not the point. The point is that clean energy is horribly underrepresented, for example, in terms of the expertise. So for banks that are lending in the energy sector, I mean, I heard, I'm sorry to pick on you, Jürgen, Jürgen said, we need baseload. If you speak to anyone in the renewable energy sector, they will tell you, no, baseload is the thing of the past. Once you hit over 20% renewables, it's really about system optimization. It's not about baseload. Baseload is a, is a mm -hmm. so without getting into energy policy, you need these views represented because that's the direction that the world is going. So I think it's going to be really important to make sure that boards have that breadth of understanding that there is a diversity of opinion um, and there are plenty of uh, tools out there to assist. So we haven't, um, that's been the focus on corporates and I think there is an opportunity um, in the financial sector um, to also do something along these lines and um, and it wouldn't just be banks, but insurers and stock exchanges and others. Um, I think it's really important to understand how much data these financial institutions are collecting on, on clients um, and disclosing the overall uh, financing of different kinds of emissions, whether it's bonds, equities or insurance. And the exposure, explicit exposure to fossil fuels is really, really important. Um, and this is also true of public banks. So we've supported the work of um, AFD in pulling together finance in common. But again, public banks are going through the process also of developing their own transition plans right now. Some of them are setting fossil fuel targets, others are setting more diversified plans. So everybody is on this journey together and we need the whole financial system, public and private, and the prudential and regulatory environment to incentivize everybody going on the next step, which is near term emissions reduction and transition action. Uh, now that we've set the long-term ambition. I hope that's helpful. Thank you, Kate. So there are many questions uh, from the audience on how, um, how can you enable this cultural change within a board to take the transition strategy seriously? I think that there are many questions think, okay, you know, how do we get started? I mean, is this a matter of, uh, 
of activism of pushing how how can this be um, pushed forward? Well, I think um, engagement is, is number one, right? Because it is a new issue for a lot of people. And as we've been discussing, it starts with, um, as Lorenzo and Jean were saying, you know, being serious about cultivating deep awareness across boards um, and not relying on, you know, your sustainability officer to solve this for you um, and having, you know, appropriate discussions as you would for any other um, serious issue. Um, I think um, some companies are deciding to do something like say on climate voluntarily, uh, where they've decided to come forward with a transition plan, disclose that to their shareholders. And you'll see in some of those early, early plans, which I've had sight of, it's some very difficult, you know, some of the dilemmas that Jürgen was talking about, right? In terms of, you know, capital allocation, near-term risk, long-term risk, you know, what is R&D versus what's deployable now? You know, if my biggest emission reduction is across the supply chain, how do I engage my supply chain? Or is it a value chain collaboration that requires regulators and other companies? So there needs to be a really thoughtful uh, process of engagement with the management on these issues. And ideally, it would be done voluntarily. Um, but over, the, over the, the coming years, I think you'll see more shareholder activism, more litigation. And there's also going to be more monitoring. Uh, CIF alone is involved in the financing of two satellites that are going to fly around the globe looking for methane leakage um, and providing that data to regulators. Um, and, you know, we're going to see more and more of this real-time time data available to track companies progress across the world. So um, I think it's only a matter of time before this becomes uh, part of the course. So getting ahead is definitely desirable. Thank you. Can, I, can I add something? Uh, maybe, I don't know if it's controversial or not, and if you like Please. it, but in the end, this is a business opportunity. I mean, you, you have it, it's easy for us in this panel because our banks, both our banks are leaders in this area of financing renewable, for instance. But clearly in the global competition, this is an area where European banks and French banks in particular have a competitive advantage and want to maintain this advantage, uh, presenting themselves, but this is not a PR issue only, it's, it's, it's a reality. If you look at the numbers, and you know, you have classifications, rankings, and, and we are top bank, banks in, in, in financing renewables, in providing transparency and so on and so forth. In, in being part of the standard setting. So this is a way to, to have a, a competitive edge. So it is in the interest of the board uh, to make sure that the management, of course, uh, uh, take, exploits this competitive edge and, and, and make sure that, that the bank, uh, our bank is, uh, is, is still on the top ranking. So this is to say that, you know, a, a climate change is not necessarily against business. I mean, if you do it right, it is, it, it is pro-business for the bank. It is, a, it, it is a way to be profitable and to have a competitive advantage over, over the others. Let, let, let me then add uh, to, to that, Mireya. Um, of course, as mentioned, we are also as committed to supporting transformational uh, change. And in order to achieve this systemic impact, we need to go beyond the project level. And as uh, was just mentioned, non-executive directors have a, I mean, a real significant role to play in addressing uh, climate change in the boardroom. Our experience shows, however, that um, boards' climate awareness, at least in our countries of operations in emerging markets, is generally low. So in France, it might be different, but in emerging markets, it is very low. So there is need for additional support. And this lack of, of um, let's call it climate awareness at the board and senior management is a particular pressure, pressing issue uh, in the context of uh, where we see state-owned enterprises. And to respond to this, um, uh, we EBRD engages with clients to enhance their climate governance and climate strategy. Uh, also climate risk management, as well as disclosure. And we provide them with uh, relevant tools at the management and board level. And we uh, also provide support to clients in developing their uh, transition pathways. And uh, again, a recent example, um, because we always attach conditionality to our loans, and this is how we uh, give the incentive. As part of a loan signed uh, only recently in 2020, with uh, the Tunisian energy utility called Stack, 
be incorporated in the project legal documents a roadmap for enhancing the company's corporate and climate governance. And very much aligned with, uh, with TCFD, what I alluded to. And, um, uh, and yes, we also ask ourselves questions like, is this the project in line with the NDCs? Uh, and I can tell you that EBRD pursued an ambitious roadmap with STEC and also the Tunisian government to reflect these considerations. So just uh, France, but the emerging market might be very different indeed. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So there's another in interesting question that will, it's a segue to our bigger governance uh, topic here, that all the banks here could be cutting the financed emissions to oil and gas. However, uh, this sector could be getting financed through other banks out there. And then mechanically your percentage of financed emissions would decrease. So certainly points to a coordination problem that we have globally, which uh, leads to the, to the question, you know, how do we, you know, what is the biggest governance challenges that are ahead of us to speed up this transition, right? It seems that uh, we cannot do it in a very unilateral fashion here. Mireille, can I help answer that question maybe? Um, so I think it's um, really important to understand that, that most of the, the major economies are now signed up to net zero, but their near-term plans, as we said, don't add up. And that's also true of businesses, right? We've got a lot of net zero ambition, but, but very little near-term action. So this is a collective uh, problem. Um, if you think about countries, and this gets to Jürgen's point about state-owned assets, right? Um, if you think about countries as well as companies, there's a lot of, of similarity in the sense, like if you take, for example, South Africa, South Africa is a middle-income country. It has a real problem with coal. ESCOM um, is, is completely wound up um, in, um, in terms of sovereign risk. And so what happens to ESCOM and the transition in ESCOM is material to South Africa's climate ambition, but also its economic future um, as, as a country. And so what we need is a good transition plan for ESCOM that's where the environmental and social pathway in terms of just transition for miners, as well as um, transition to clean energy, that that is clearly validated as an appropriate pathway and that there are the right financing tools available, um, both public and private. Um, and so that means that the European creditors of ESCOM have to get together and they have to decide this is an appropriate speed for the retirement of coal assets. Um, you know, the US could come in with some support in terms of clean energy. And then you would have what we refer to as a transition transaction, but at a country level that will enable greater ambition. So we need to look at where are these stressed dirty assets around the world and think of how we're going to deal with this. And this comes to the point, I can't remember who made it about the taxonomy. We need a green taxonomy, but we also need to understand how we're going to deal with uh, the brown assets um, or the sludgy green assets that are kind of in the middle and in transition. And what are the appropriate pathways? And that will be different for different countries and different companies. But there has to be a transparent conversation. And we always have to have the North Star of net zero, which means halving global emissions by by 2030. So it is a collective action problem, but all of the decisions matter. We can't say, I can't do it because they're not doing it. Um, and just finally, I would say to your point um, that was made, that Jürgen made about emerging markets um, and understanding of these issues. Um, a recent NYU report said that only 3% of the S&P 100 directors, they considered climate competent, right? So the US is still an emerging market in terms of, of ESG relative to Europe, coming back to Lorenzo's point on competitive advantage. So we've all got a lot of work to do and hopefully with COP26, that will kind of point people in the right direction. I hope that helps. Thank you, Kate. Yes, let me pass the baton to Jean Lemire in terms of what is the biggest challenge to... Well, beyond, beyond what, were, what was said, you know, the, uh, I think European Union is much advanced and has taken the lead on these matters. Uh, the work on taxonomy, uh, the work done by uh, the corporate and banking sector in, in the EU uh, has certainly uh, taken the lead of the process. I'm very happy the Americans have decided to join. It's positive. But climate shouldn't be a cause for competition. 
we should not, we should not, we should compete among banks and corporate sector, of course, notably on the fact that we move forward quickly. But the norms and the standards shouldn't be an element of competition. And in my view, the most urgent uh, policy action would be for the EU and the American to sit together and try to decide common standards, common norms and goals. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I know what's going to happen if we don't do it. It's greenwashing, which is the worst, which is to pretend we do well at a time we don't. Pretend to do well at a time it's even worse than doing nothing. So there is a risk in that process. We support a lot of the process, we're part of it, but there is a risk which is greenwashing. And we don't want to see this because not only it's unfair competition, but it's a disaster because it delays and the, 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 the improvements. So add the uh, G7 level or G20 level or whatever it is, they should sit together and try to decide common measurement system, norms and standards in order to see what we do. Otherwise, we shall never be able to understand what's happening. Of course, governments have a responsibility, which is to set up policies for their countries. But at least in our activity, we need to have a common uh, set of measurement tools and standards, because otherwise there's no valid disclosure. We shall not be able to compare and to know where we are. But so how we shall... far away are we from these common standards? I think we are at the very beginning of it, simply because the Americans have just decided to join. Of course, there's a lot of work done in accounting firms. Yes, the World Economic Forum has worked on this. Fine, there are good initiatives, but we need to go faster, deeper, and more global. And it must be endorsed fully by the official sector. It's a teamwork, you know. Each company will not deliver alone. Each government cannot deliver alone. It's a teamwork. Can, I, can I add um, something? Um, I think what Jean said is, is, is clear. But we have to be aware that we will not become a better world only with rules and with standards. Let me take an example. In Europe, we have the best standards for data protection, but all the companies that deal with data are American. And they do, you know, all over the world what they want. So we need also to invest. We need to put money. And banks clearly are those that can help, but this, the public sector also has to play its role. So in, in uh, 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 the climate transition uh, uh, issue, we need to be very influential as Europeans because we start with the highest standards, but we need to involve, of course, the, the Americans and the rest of the world, as Jean said, but also we need to, to make sure that we have the instruments and the power to, to finance technological change mm -hmm. that will lead to the solutions. Uh, uh, to, to the dilemmas, of course, that, that we face. And, uh, and, and so my fear and my word of caution is in particular to the public authorities, to the regulators, uh, not to penalize only uh, the financing. So to have a, an attitude of, uh, you know, uh, in terms of banking, just raising capital uh, ratios, as it's, it, it appears to be the tendency now <laughs> after these first uh, stress tests that have been implemented, you know, the reaction is let's raise capital ratios across the, 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 uh, across the board. That, that could be dangerous if this reduces the need to finance uh, renewables, or to finance technology, uh, to finance uh, uh, research and development. Uh, that is needed to address the issue of, uh, of greening. Uh, because we need a lot of investment, and, and that's, that cannot be done only through regulation. May, may I add one point? Because I, I think what, what we say, Lorenzo and I, must be well understood. 
we are not waiting for hmm, policies. We do the job today. We have started doing it. We are implementing. We are changing policies and uh, decision company by company. But we could go faster, much faster, if the whole system were aligned on these goals. I, I, I think we, we need, mm -hmm. of course, we have a huge responsibility and we take it, we, we do it. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason to wait for it for before acting. But I, I know what may happen. And once more, I don't want greenwashing. And I know that it will be easier. We shall avoid unintended consequences, delays, and at the end of the day, a negative impact if we are not consistent on the governance point of view. And that's the point you have raised. And we need consistency. Mireya, of course, I agree with the two gentlemen. And of course, it's a, a, a global problem and a global problem means we can only solve it with a global solution. However, Jean mentioned we are at the beginning. I, I think we're not, not even at the beginning uh, because I mean, how long have we been talking about a global carbon tax? And I know for sure it will not come for quite some time. Um, so until that point, we actually have to, uh, um, with, with, with a few like-minded, and luckily these few are becoming more and more, you know, we have to set our own standards. But we will not be able, uh, only be able to do this with rules, because what I see more and more, and also now I include emerging markets, is that actually from an economic point of view, it's actually becoming more and more interesting to actually go renewables. Renewables in many markets, in many instances, are far superior than the traditional uh, fossil fuel uh, solution. So actually there's also now more and more an economic incentive to, to go that route. And then lastly, um, I mean, the word which hasn't been used yet is China, uh, you know, global also means, means China. Once in a while, uh, I get the, um, uh, the question, why do you work with China? And of course, many of us can say, you know, uh, China, do your own thing. Our experience is that uh, with uh, EBRD or other IFIs for that matter, and probably also international banks, actually these banks or EBRD, we will not lower our standards. We actually make sure that China or Chinese banks, et cetera, abide by our standards. And the solution, as said, it only can be done globally, and that means including our friends from China and beyond. Thank you, Jürgen. Let me pass to Kate. I think you wanted to make a contribution. Um, well, it's, it's such a rich um, discussion. I, I mean, for me, I, I, think, I think ultimately Jean is, of course, right that we need to have um, this needs to be regulated um, eventually because we can't afford to have laggards and free riders forever. That's just not feasible. And it also massively increases the cost of doing business when there's too much uh, regulatory uh, complexity and not enough harmonization. Um, but I think uh, Jürgen is also right that um, the leadership is at a premium right now. And I think, you know, what is interesting is that this time last year, um, you know, I'm a friend of COP26. Um, this time last year, we were sort of scratching our heads about where the momentum was going to come from. Um, and then, you know, the COVID crisis happened and we feared the worst for the climate negotiations. But actually, um, it's been a surprisingly resilient issue. And then Xi Jinping made his announcement of net zero uh, 2060 um, and peaking well before 2030. And then Korea and Japan followed suit. And then you regain momentum. Um, and the US is back in the, back in the game. So um, 
you know, I think there is an, an inevitability to all of this. I think the real, there are very real challenges in the near term, but there is also some really positive signals. Uh, renewable funding um, on the Belt and Road overtook coal funding for the first time last year. Um, you've got a lot of interesting things happening. We're in a very volatile period, but I think we're gonna come out the other side with, with much greater alignment globally because countries that want to sell goods into Europe, they're going to have to meet those standards, right? So, um, you know, it's it's not in the interests of somebody selling into Europe to get financing from Asia um, to fund fossil fuel assets that then get caught up with border tax adjustments because of the embedded carbon in what they're producing. It doesn't make sense. So there is, there is uh, leverage from being a leader. There is an impact. But I think ultimately, Jean is right. We need to have um, harmonization and common standards. And I think the US really needs to get on board with, with that multilateralism because Europe and Asia, for example, through uh, the International Platform on Sustainable Finance have started to develop shared taxonomy and methodologies. And it would be crazy if the US went off and did their own thing, right? We, we've, we've got to align. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think there are a few questions Final questions, um, thinking about, you know, whether the financial system could move faster and pressure governments to actually, um, you know, speed up this need for harmonization. And um, I don't know if you want Lorenzo or Jean um, say something about this, this potential, you know, collaboration with the governments to just speed this up. Um, Look, I, of course, I do share the views I've made with governments and, uh, and institutions. Yes, we, we we have a dialogue and we insist a lot on this. You know, I even I can insist on one point. We, we have the view that the EU once more has set up uh, fine rules. You know, we, we have some rules and uh, and governments have agreed on the rules. So we, 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 we can help to speed up the process, of course, would be a good example. Lorenzo, would you like to add anything else on uh, on this point, on the role of uh, you know, a bank that is fully embedded in energy? How can can you lead forward? And, and it's a matter of uh, speeding up, right? No, I, I, I mean, of course, we are all in favor. The, the fear is instead of moving backwards uh, 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 because you don't, you, you tend to address an issue uh, um, uh, uh, with instruments that might have unintended consequences over over the long term. Um, for instance, one mistake would be to say, oh, now we discover uh, that there is a climate risk. Uh, we discover that uh, these climate risks uh, create a financial uh, um, instability. So we raise protection uh, everywhere. We raise capital ratio. We make everything more complicated. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is a risk because if this is not accompanied by creating uh, room for instead providing more funds more to money. those sectors that need it uh, uh, to, as I was mentioning earlier, to finance technological innovation, uh, uh, R&D and so on and so forth, then the risk is that, as we've seen with recent vaccination, that uh, sometimes Europe reaction is to be more protective so to stop the process instead of accelerating so let's be careful in in in, in choosing the long-term goals and having measures that are consistent with these uh, uh, long-term goals not uh, react immediately with things that could lead in initially at least to to stop the process or to slow down the process um, Mireille, can I just mention, pick up something that Jean was saying about um, greenwashing? And I think this is a really, really important point and, and why these issues are not merely matters of reputation. Um, if you speak to um, those in the climate movement or indeed the young people on the streets, Fridays for Future, um, you know, they are very live to the issue of greenwashing and false solutions. And in addition, you have, as I was saying, the emergence of real time data through, you know, geospatial technologies and other things which are going to be um, creating, you know, radical transparency and hyper local real time data around emissions and other things. We're already um, 
seeing geospatial projects which are um, mapping all the polluting plants around the world um, and tagging them and from space you can see the amount of pollution that's and measure that's coming out of smokestacks and so on so we're entering a period of radical transparency um and and greenwashing is is not going to fly in this context um and, and the real risk in the near term is that we lose publics along the way that they no longer trust companies, they no longer trust banks, and they no longer trust their governments. And we all know that that ends with um, some, something very dangerous for all of our societies. So I think it's really important that people are honest about the challenges, um, that they make robust commitments, um, and that they disclose um, their performance, because otherwise we will lose uh, social license and it's really really important at this period in our history um, that we do not lose the confidence of publics on this journey. Thank you Kate and I think that with this final reflection on, on keeping the trust um, we close this uh, very interesting conversation on, uh, on transition and the details of transition. I hope that we have really incented our non-executive directors that attended this session to actually uh, think about designing real action plans that will transition their own corporations and thinking about their own skills of how they can push a different culture in their boards to actually make this transition happen at their corporations. I would like to thank Lorenzo Binismagi, Jean Lemire, Jürgen Rintering, and Kate Hampton. Thank you very much for your contributions, your thoughts on uh, this transition towards a zero carbon economy hopefully sooner than, than later. Thank you very much for all your input. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.